Hello, and welcome to episode 004. In this episode, I will cover my attempt at repairing alkaline battery leak damage to a wall mount Skyscan Atomic WWV syncing LCD clock with outdoor and indoor temperature reporting. This item is not of huge value, but I am sure we have all had gadgets we liked that have succumbed to the poor quality of alkaline battery manufacturing, causing us inconvenience at best and misery at worst as our beloved battery operated toys either end up in the recycle stream or make us go through attempts to get them back to working condition. I am attempting the second and will share my exploits with you in this video. Hello and welcome to the next episode, episode 4 of Poor Man's Electronics Bench. In this episode I'm going to try to do a quickie gadget repair, kind of a pellet cleanser from my last last lengthy rebuild. I have a older, it's a Skyscan branded atomic clock. This particular model is very similar to the Lacrosse models. It has an indoor and outdoor temperature function on it and it also has a uh, receiver for a remote sensor plus it does pick up the, sim the, the signal from WWV to set the time accurately and then it also it also sets the uh, picks up the time date and uh, sets the moon phase accurately if you do this right. What I was finding when I usually use this particular item was that all you had to do was get the temperature sensor to sync up with it, set your time zone, hang it up on a hang it up in a hopefully good spot that'll receive WWV overnight, and by the next morning it should do its thing and set set a proper accurate time with uh, it'll actually have a little radio symbol on the clock too. The one problem with this item is it succumbed to some alkaline battery leakage that I'm going to have to address on the uh, one of the battery terminals. As far as I know the clock itself worked last time I used it but the poor battery terminals, uh, you know, the quality of alkaline batteries that we get nowadays is just garbage and they end up leaking and this one's got some minor damage on the one one terminal and some major on the other one so I'm going to go in after it and going to tr attempt to get some removal of the crud and hopefully some good metal for a battery to contact and put it all back together put batteries in it and then give a report on how it functions after setting it up going so I'm going to take a pause and get a screwdriver handy and get to taking the unit apart. Okay, I'm back. I found a good fitting screwdriver and we're going to take our screws off. Hopefully it'll just be the six on the back. And I'm going to hope for easy disassembly after that. I don't know what technicians' preferences are for having their tools magnetized or not. I usually appreciate screwdrivers being magnetized because they help me install and remove screws and I might also be able to use them to retrieve something that I dropped in a small area. Every now and then you need something de demagnetized and I do have a coil for that. So see what that did for us. It got us to remove the end plates. It's curious, we have a little little antenna coil. So somewhere in here there has to be some sort of shortwave receiver. I've never had one of these open to investigate its, its innards, so this ought to be fun. Ah, I got two more screws in the bottom. Okay. Yeah, that's where the issue is. There were eight screws. Two of them are kind of hidden in the obscure spot. 
I might need a little bit narrower screwdriver to get in for these. Everybody, I'm sure, has got some gadgets that have been damaged by leaking alka alkaline batteries that need repair. And I'm no different from about any other consumer in the U.S. And I'm not trying to force it, but... Sometimes it looks like these battery terminals have to slide down with it, so I'll give them a little push from the back side and hopefully they will. Yeah, because two of the terminals slid down already, I can see that. The one is stuck with corrosion. They apply a little pressure from both sides. There we go. And all our buttons came out of it. That shouldn't be a big deal. Now I have to be careful with that antenna coil. Ooh. Yikes. So we have. Let's see if I can place this carefully off to the side. This antenna coil is quite interesting. It's probably probably a very well tuned circuit to be able to pick up WWV, but here's the contents of the inside here, at least from the top view. I'll have to get a little bit better view. Looks like we have our battery terminals. Our push buttons, one capacitor. Boy, I'm gonna guess that's some sort of small diode. Another diode. That thing is a pinpoint little radial lead or axial lead guy. Radio, I should say. And then another tuned coil, a capacitor, variable capacitor. Interesting. So I'm going to see if I can separate this board from the clock. Now, ooh, that's going to cause another set of issues probably from separating them from, from the display as well. But I think I have to at least loosen the screws. Loosen or remove the screws because if not I can't... I'm betting there's some sort of plastic standoffs inside there holding the screws. It'll be interesting to see how these connect to the liquid crystal panels. One panel, oh, okay. Ah, zebra strips, great. That'll be fine. So this lets me access the board. And it just has the conductive zebra strips on it, just like most other liquid crystal displays. So. <laughs> Most times they realign fine when you go to install things up again. If not, then it's usually a couple of a couple of trial and error sessions. But I'm sure most people that have taken any LCD stuff apart has played with these before. They're they're called zebra strips. They have little conductive tracks in them, and they uh, interface between a liquid crystal display and whatever electronics are driving it. And 
they don't, you know, like I said, they don't usually get damaged. 99 out of 100 times, it seems like you can take them apart and reassemble them. So, so right now we have to address our corroded solder connections. Luckily, it doesn't look like there's any damage to the board itself. I can't see any thing that's visibly damaged on this side. The corrosion luckily went downhill. Now these solder tabs, it looks like they're going to be these long blobs here. And I really only need to access the bottom two. Those are the ones... I don't need to disturb the top ones, but the two on the bottom are the ones that are really badly damaged. I'm going to make an attempt at removing them instead of cleaning them in place, because I wouldn't wouldn't be happy if I damaged the damaged the board any more than I needed to. I'm just going to have to get enough of that solder up as possible, so I'm going to have to heat up an iron. I have some solder wick. And we're going to see what we can do for for removing as much solder as possible to get those two connections off of the board. So I'll be back in a little bit when my iron heats up. Okay, I'm back. The iron's still heating up a little bit, but just to show you how long I've been tinkering around in the electronics hobby, just it's been on a back burner for quite a while, but I found my old roll of solder wick. It's actually an old roll of Phillips ECG Swift Wick, and if you Google this stuff, you can't even find it on Google. It's so old, so <laughs> it's just kind of funny that it's uh, it's like that. So, so I put a little flux on the Swift Wick and on the joint, and I'm going to try to. I should cut that partial view stuff off too. Might might be a good idea. And we're gonna see how things work with some wick here. If, it does, if this doesn't work well, I'll, I do have a desoldering station, but I don't really want to bring that into play if I don't have to. So. Seems to be seems to be doing its intended purpose. I just want to cut off the use pieces as I go. So I'm awful close to the tracks for that one. I see next to it. I probably should have covered that up. It fell right out of the board. So that I think that that's a success successful removal removal there. And then I'm going to cut off this one. This use piece as well. <clears throat> Looks like there's just some surface mount resistors on this side. I'm going to add a... <coughs> excuse me. A little seasonal cough I get. Add a little flux to him and to the solder itself. Drink itself and we'll... Hope that this one is as as successful. There we go. Okay, so soaked up that much. I'll cut off the used piece. And it sounds like that one as well fell right to the board. I'm going to clean off the last couple areas of solder here.
just get it prepped for the reinstallation. I want I have to get some nice clean holes there. Oh, it almost fell off. It's Boy, oh boy. Okay. I will leave it as it is. Uh, it looks like we've got clean, clean holes and a lot of flux around the joints, so I'll probably clean up some of that. But in the meantime, I'm going to get to the process of trying to clean off those individual clips before I reinstall them. I'll have to try to blow all the little pieces of crud off of this as well before we assembly, but right now we have it doesn't look like we've damaged anything, but we have our two pins. It looks like it's got a little, little burn from the soldering there, but the other one the other one didn't look bad at all. If you look at the parts here, this one's pretty gritty. Let me get a better background here. I'm going to try to clean these with a rust remover. I had some success with the that Sencor ES-102 panel, and I'm thinking a mild, uh, probably a quick soak with this one. The other one might take a little more, but hopefully it'll chemically remove as much of the corrosion as possible. Uh, the only I could go could go brute force, just brushing this one and cleaning it up with some vinegar brush. I clean it up with alcohol. This one isn't too bad. I might just do that with this one. The other one, though, it's, it needs a little more attention, and this this would either I can probably start out with uh, some vinegar as a cleaner first, see how it looks, and then give, give it a quick quick shot with the, the rust and corrosion remover, and hopefully it'll improve things a little bit more. But we will see how things go. I'm going to apply some cleaning time to these, and we'll be back in a bit. I chose to do something slightly unconventional and try to use a liquid tinning solution to restore some kind of coating to the exposed copper slash brass after it was cleaned in order to try to prevent more issues with corrosion. This required me to take a break and await the arrival of supplies, so a part two with the cleaning, completion of repairs, and testing is in the works. This content is available on YouTube and Odyssey.com. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Hope you return soon.